Hello, and welcome back to Inside College Admissions, a podcast presented by SCORE. I'm Dr. Robert Ovosa, and I serve as the superintendent in residence and support school districts and schools across our network. Today, I am happy to be joined by Dr. Dana Godick. Dr. Godick is a policy and practice champion for states, districts, and schools across the country. Her particular area of expertise is social and emotional learning. She helps implement lots of new and interesting programs across the country. She earned her doctorate degree and organizational leadership degree, widely recognized as an authority, public education policy. She also in her spare time, which I don't know how you have any, works at Florida Atlantic University where she's a faculty member in the College of Education. Very happy to have you here today, Dr. Godick. Thanks so much. It's an honor to be here. I'm delighted to share some insight on social and emotional learning, obviously a very timely topic. So thank you, Dr. Avosa, for shining a light on this and elevating this as it's part of our national conversation in support of states, schools, and students. So really an honor to be here. Well, thank you so much. I spent 25 years in public education as a teacher principal, district leader, and the last seven years as a school superintendent. And I have the great pleasure of talking with school superintendents and their teams from across the country. And as you might imagine, one of the things that that folks are really worried about right now is all the social isolation that our students and teachers are feeling, the pressure that COVID has put on them economically, um, has put on their families in terms of the lack of Uh, relationships, the lack of opportunity to be with one another, and that concerns them, rightfully so. Obviously, the learning loss component uh, is a high priority. We want to make sure our students are well. Dr. Godick, tell me a little bit about whether or not that squares up with what you're hearing and seeing and what folks might be doing about it. Yeah, I appreciate that a lot. So in my collaborative work at a policy level with CASEL, who of course is the research entity for social and emotional learning internationally, and then also the Committee for Children. We've been doing a deep dive and and really watching uh, what the growth has been in states and other entities interested in social and emotional learning in support of students, as you're saying, not to pathologize student mental health or mental wellness based on the, you know, frankly, negative benefits of social isolation, but more to really elevate practices that are universal to all, right? So teachers can implement social and emotional learning practices, parents can, um, but at the end of the day, students really can, because it's all about developing their competence and skills at the individual level so that our most vulnerable and disenfranchised students have tools to navigate this crazy world. And it got a lot crazier in 2020. Um, So uh, we're really honored to be watching lots of states um, making some of those very specific shifts. And I'll point to uh, just some numbers. So out of our 50 states, 38 of them have launched re-entry return plans based on really good guidance from Chiefs for Change and other national organizations. And they're explicitly using the term social and emotional learning or SEL to support student well-being. So that's a really exciting sort of shift, which is, I'd like to think of it as sort of a sunrise to a really dark night, um, bringing SEL practices to states schools and students. I couldn't agree with you more. I do believe that this notion of agency is a discussion that really warrants additional conversation and time, but students need to feel like they're in the driver's seat, that they can also provide, you know, an opportunity for themselves and that they're not just sort of Uh, on their own at the mercy of the tides, if you will. You made a point though, that I really feel like I wanna get some clarity on, which is I hear people throwing around the word SEL a lot. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, and in some ways, I think it causes some confusion. Mm -hmm. In your professional opinion, what is the right definition of SEL? How should we be really using this? You know, is it a mental health issue? Is it, you know, I just, I think there's a lot of confusion around what what that definition is. 
Yeah, thanks. Let's take just a second to sort of disentangle that because of the impact benefits of SEL is a good state of mental wellness, if you will. But again, SEL in and of itself is not therapeutic mental health. It is a universal approach to support human development. So you asked a great question, which is what is SEL? And I'll just point to the literature and research on that. It's SEL really is just the process by which young people and adults acquire and apply knowledge, skills, attitudes to develop a healthy identity, right? So it helps them manage their emotions, achieve their own personal goals and hopefully collective goals, um, feel and show empathy for others and uh, maintain positive relationships, particularly their relationship with themselves. Um, and on a good day to your point on agency, Dr. Rivosa, um, SEL really is a lever to advance individual equity and excellence by establishing some strong family, school, community partnerships um, and translating that to learning environments and experiences right, so that it's meaningful, right? Curriculum, of course, should be rigorous and instruction should be rigorous. And we understand that SEL can be and should be uh, integrated and infused in curriculum instruction and teaching and learning to achieve the right kinds of academic outcomes for students, but putting students in the, in the driver's seat of those outcomes. So we're coming at it from an asset-based mentality as opposed to, um, you know, obviously a deficit. We want to empower young people. Right. And so one of the things that, you know, I'll push leadership and even counselors to really think differently about who's sort of in charge of this, right? Uh, for so many years in public education, we have put people in silos. You are an English language learner. You are a special education student, you are in the gifted program, right? When in reality, you know, people ought to be thinking about these things woven together as best practices, regardless of your quote unquote bucket that people have put you in. Counselors aren't the only ones who should be thinking about and working on social emotional learning is what I'm hearing from you, right? So this isn't Absolutely. just some sort of group or individual who's responsible for this. We kind of really all are. Talk to me a little bit about that component. Sure, thanks for that. So SEL, we find it nationally showing up in districts actually organized in the teaching and learning space. That is, believe it or not, predominantly where SEL is housed. And we, we would recommend that, right? Because it's just part of good teaching and learning. So where the school counselor role sometimes gets a little bit confused is that a counselor has a very specialized uh, set of training, very specialized approaches and strategies, and is absolutely essential to a school community, a school environment, and for students that really need more intensive services as they move up tiers, if you will. So if you think of it through a multi-tiered system of supports, or um, you know, think about students that may move from sort of a universal level to needing something more supportive, that would be really the time when a school counselor or other trained practitioner, licensed mental health worker might work with that student, or um, in some cases, an adult to provide that level of support. But yeah, nationally, um, I'm really pleased to see that states and particularly districts really think of SEL as good instruction and house it within the content areas. So this whole notion of crosswalking among those content areas really is where the exciting work that districts and schools do take root and allow for SEL to come up in good classroom instruction and in conversation that is universal to all. Well, I realize that some of the, the most impactful work you're doing is with the collaborative academic, social, and emotional learning group called CASEL. Mm -hmm. And that work really does probably at the highest level start with state policy, right? That begins to shape how districts or local education agencies begin thinking about the work. Uh, talk with me a little bit about the states that are out there doing some of this work and maybe what, what's going well, right? Like elevating the state policies at 
that's actually working. Yeah, thanks. It's really an honor and I'm very humbled to watch these states in action. I'm learning so much by sort of synthesizing their uh, practices and their bright spots and um, really what's working. And as you know, one of the things that I'm really proud of this year is working through a process where we've analyze what states are doing and what those most strongest examples are. And we've come up with six different recommendations to support other states as they think about leveraging SEL in responding to the pandemic um, and strong restarting and really providing that universal support to students, but also to the adults that care for them, right? Because teachers um, other instructional leaders, you can't blame them for feeling a sense of burnout and stress. So uh, I can't emphasize enough, these practices are good for all. So uh, six recommendations there, and I can elevate a couple of examples. The first recommendation I would offer is really communicating SEL as important. I mean, it's just that simple. So if we just say this discipline or that discipline is important, that's true. And I very much um, appreciate and admire the STEM movement. And at some point we saw that that maybe was prime and the arts kind of got pushed into the background and then really smart people figured out a way to come up with STEAM, which was a great way of integrating critical and creative skills all in one. But in the case of SEL, since it is a cross-walkable, yeah, I just made up a word, since it's a cross-walkable element into multiple discipline areas, merely communicating its importance really is an effective practice. And we see that from state chiefs, like state chiefs in Illinois and Michigan have identified uh, the well-being of students and adults as top priorities in support and other states like Washington and even Florida have turned to social media to communicate how important it is to provide that level of support. Ohio is using uh, Twitter very, very effectively to redirect people to their learning platforms to gain a perspective on SEL and have just some quick actionable items. Um, and even North Carolina has organized a reopening task force that has identified SEL as a top priority and has tip sheets, if you will, for the field on how to really think that through as schools are reopening um, for live in-person learning. The second recommendation I would offer is really coordinating SEL and mental health supports. To your prior question, Dr. Vosa, not to conflate them, really to define them as separate and distinct. And some states do that incredibly well, like Indiana and Wisconsin. They've linked their SEL competencies within COVID response, but then they've also organized things like a resource map um, that intentionally identifies SEL as a tier one approach. Kansas is doing that really well too and organize that through a continuum, right? So SEL is universal and tier one. There are tier two and tier three SEL intervention strategies, but really that's more for a specialized person in a mental health field. When it comes to classroom support, New Jersey, Kentucky, California, they're all doing fantastic jobs in providing strategies to support all youth, whether they be special ed, LGBTQ, foster care or McKinney-Vento um, experiencing homelessness during this time, um, those types of more intensive supports are coming through the school counseling or, you know, a, a, a therapeutic sort of approach. Where can people learn more about these sorts of recommendations? I do want to walk through the last four quickly, but where might folks go and, and really want to dive in deeper? Sure. So, Report that I referenced is on, of course, castlecasel.org and it's on Committee for Children's website. You can even put in SEL COVID response into a, a social media feed and it's likely to pop up. So that's, that's kind of a, a quick way to find it. Got it. Uh, let's go ahead and walk through the last four and then we'll wrap up with what folks can do. Great. So the obvious ones that connect to the first two are disseminating SEL practices, right? So 
it's good to identify it, it's good to define and disentangle it, but then what do we do? So states like North Carolina, New Mexico are really encouraging districts to take a systemic approach. Colorado, we see some great classroom level practices coming out of Louisiana. So lots of excitement there on disseminating what we hope are really high quality and evidence-based examples. And of course, that's symbiotic or goes hand in hand with providing good professional learning and support, right? So that would be recommendation for providing good support for adults um, in understanding the competencies, understanding the skill development. Another great group of states that are doing that is uh, Utah, New York, um, they're hosting community of practice calls and really providing support to promote healthy schools and healthy educators and reinforce the practices through professional learning. Last two, data, 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 right? So we always want to look at continuous improvement, how to get stronger. SEL data is sort of interesting, but that, that doesn't mean that SEL impact can't be measured and we see lots of good examples of that also from states really thinking through guidance and whether or not guidance is being implemented, resources on school and staff readiness assessments, really putting the emphasis and focus on the adult SEL. I'm seeing a lot of fascinating work on that topic come out of Rhode Island and also come out of Indiana. So very exciting. And then last but not least, um, music to my ears in my federal uh, legislative and funding policy hat, um, which is encouraging the use of funds, right? The, the flexibility around CARES 1 and 2, and even ESSA funds. Honestly, if you can document, if you can identify and document the need for social emotional learning and understanding that that is an instructional strategy, there's, there's very little restrictions on the integration of SEL within strong instructional approaches and strong student whole child wellness approaches. So there's a, a lot of good um, guidance on that as well. Connecticut has a very um, sound white paper outlining the need to think about those um, flexibilities and use of those funds. And of course, um, we're kind of looking to that white paper to signal to some maybe coming attractions out of Department of Ed. <laughs> right. There's definitely some exciting news there. And, you know, it, it brings me back to this notion that if you're out there and you're listening to Dr. Godick and I talk about this, you don't feel like you need to reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of resources and investments that have already been made, you know, and spend some time researching and making sure that you're looking at and emulating those that are research-based and have produced results. This is a three-part series. Dr. Godick and I will continue our conversation and two upcoming podcasts. Just as a note, for those of you who are enjoying the conversation, we look forward to continuing that. Uh, what I'd like to do here as we transition into the last part of our conversation is really, you know, what can we do? We, meaning all of us, uh, either in the field, we're policymakers, we're teachers, we're counselors, principals, and others. Uh, what are some of the things that we can do to try to help continue this conversation and watching it unfold in a very positive way in our schools? Yeah, so thank you for that. I just want to underscore the value and what I heard you say. I mean, reinventing the wheel is tedious, tiresome, and produces mixed results. Going to high quality clearing houses like castle.org and looking at program guides and reviews will, will support you and save you a lot of time by identifying evidence-based programs and practices. So we always wanna encourage folks to do that. But on the, on the ground, like where the rubber meets the road, really paying attention to staff well-being um, and helping them manage you know, their stress and their wellness while they're getting themselves back in front of students in person or even virtually. That's a whole other fascinating topic that, you know, this international experiment really is producing for us. So staff well-being, student and family well-being, of course, the best practice there is to communicate, communicate, communicate use technology to communicate in ways that maybe you haven't before. If you're uh, unfamiliar with social, get on social. 
Uh, Dr. Vosa, you're very prolific on social. You know exactly what I'm talking about. That is a fantastic shortcut in connecting with parents. And if you find that there are other ways to do that, other safe ways to do that, over communicating, having a presence, but still prioritizing yourself and taking care of yourself is incredibly important at this time. Well, I cannot thank you enough, Dr. Godick. You've provided a very inspirational and positive you know, set of talking points. Folks who are listening, thank you so much for joining us today. I am looking forward to our continued conversations, Dr. Godick, and we hope that this has been helpful for all of our listeners. Thank you so much for being with me today. It's an honor. Thank you, Dr. Vosa, and thanks to all of our courageous educators in the United States. <laughs>